Unfortunately, evolution is taught as absolute truth. It's a sad fact that public educators don't reveal the major flaws of this molecule-to-man theory. Contemporary teachings of evolution are based upon several false assumptions of genetics and speciation, which the scientific community has failed to seriously recognize. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, Evolution's Flawed Thinking with Dr. Kevin Anderson. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science, along with other important facts validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Dr. Kevin Anderson, received his PhD in microbiology and was a research fellow at the National Institutes of Health. He has served as a university professor, taught graduate level molecular biology, directed the research of advanced degree students, and was the director of research for a biotech company. He has also written numerous technical publications and is currently the director of the Van Andel Creation Research Center in Arizona. Welcome to the program, Dr. Anderson. It's my pleasure to be here. Evolution's flawed thinking. What are we going to be talking about today? Well, there's a number of flaws in the assumptions and then the conclusions that evolutionists often draw. So we're gonna kind of explore and talk about some of those. You see, Darwin made an initial assumption in his Origin of Species that all animals and plants have descended from some one prototype. In other words, what he's saying is that all life is universally connected, what we would call universal common descent. The tree of life, we've the, all the seen that life, diagram, right? right. To... And even though evolutionist day may portray it as a little more complicated than this, this is still the essence of it, that, that life started here very simple, which it's not really simple, but they want it to be simple. Darwin didn't know that much about biology because no one at that time did. So it was assumed the cells were simple. The smaller and you go, yes, the more yes, like the a, more simple it yeah. is. But what we see from universal common descent is that all life shares ancestry. In other words, we and dogs and cats and cows and fish and lizards and trees all share a common ancestry somewhere back here. See, so as you go back in time, we then share common ancestry. So all life arose through this process of trans massive transformation. And at some point in time, there weren't humans. There was something that evolved into human. There weren't cows. There was something that evolved into cows. There weren't trees. There was something that evolved into trees. And so that's what Dharma is meaning by all life arose from some one prototype. Today, what they would argue is the tree of life is driven by what's called speciation. Okay, so they would say that all that are classified today in the same kingdom means that they now have a common evolutionary ancestry where new species just keep coming on the scene and eventually then you have what are now classified as phylums, what are now classified as orders, so, so you're for, getting more specific. Exactly. Kingdoms, the exactly. general. Exactly. Okay. So, so, for example, dogs and cats would share us the same evolutionary history here. Whatever evolved into a dog and a cat would be somewhere around what we classify as an order today. So they would need an actual dog-cat creature, so, a something type like of, that, right? right? A type of, yes. And, and then it then it diverged off into the it two diverged different diverged off and branches. evolved different species slowly new species then another new species and eventually becomes a dog and eventually becomes a cat and so now we have today what we classify as species mm. and the way they would see this working as random variation because they can't have anything that's designed or specific cuz that would 
one that would need a designer that would need someone coming in and specifically programming so they wanted to be random just just happens just changes that occur randomly and then natural selection comes into play determining okay are you going to survive better because you now run faster you now swim further you now fly higher so if you can survive better then your chances of of being able to reproduce are better because now you can adapt better to whatever environment it is. Maybe it's a hot environment, so you now, through the random variation and the survival selection, you now survive better in dry climates. So uh, just to make it specific, that dog-cat-lizard creature, <laughs> somehow the dog-cat creature survived better than the dog-cat-lizard creature, and it moved in, to that yes, stage. Yes, in, in the particular in that environment. environment. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, if you can't adapt then you become extinct because obviously you're not thriving very well, you're not reproducing very well, and so you just die out. But if you can adapt, see, now you become a new species. You've changed enough, you're now a new species, and you now repeat the process. You go through random variation again, do you survive better, which means you've adapted, now you're a new species again. And you just keep repeating this process over and over where eventually you become so changed, so altered that now you're a fish walking on land becoming a lizard. Or you're now a lizard growing feathers and wings and now you're a bird. You know, so, it seems like, and, and, and maybe this isn't the case, but it seems like really there isn't ever a a species. I mean, there really isn't ever a certain kind of animal that just stops, right? Everything's always changing. Right? Everything by this would mean you either are changing and adapting or you're dying. Yeah. Okay. By this scenario, correct. Now, really, to understand this and understand the arguments that the evolutionists are proposing, we need to first look at, well, what is a species? In today's classification, a species represents the lowest level of biological classification. In other words, if you're the same species as another organism, you're the same thing. That's what we really mean. A lot of people get confused because the Bible talks about God creating kinds, kinds of plants, kinds of animals. That's not the same thing then, a species exactly. and a kind. Exactly. It's not, not the same thing as species. And even Darwin got confused about this. He assumed that kinds and species were the same thing. Because he assumed they're the same thing, then when he recognized that speciation seems to occur, well, then maybe kinds aren't set like the Bible suggests, so the Bible's wrong. He made a wrong conclusion from that. We have to remember, biblical kind is God's classification system. Species is human classification system. All right, so what's a common definition of species is ability to interbreed. If you're the same thing, you can interbreed. Now, there's some problems in that. First off, it only applies to sexual reproduction. If you're an organism that can undergo asexual reproduction, then it's very hard to classify based on your ability of interbreeding because you don't interbreed. All right. Second, we also have difficulty making reproductive distinction. You know, where is the species line drawn? Let me give a classic example. And this is very common in insects and in birds. All right, let's say that bird A and bird B can interbreed. Well, same species, right? Okay. Now, let's say that bird B and bird C can interbreed. Same species by that definition. But A and C should be the same species, right, by that definition. So they should be able to interbreed, but they can't. So we actually have this kind of an example where... Many of these kinds of examples. That does so seem to pose a problem. It does pose a problem, very much so. Where's the species line drawn? Is it drawn, is it drawn here? Is it drawn here? Where is it drawn at? Mm. Especially, well, and if reproduction is the thing you're going by, then yeah, you've got a problem there. Exactly. And it depends, it really comes down to philosophy more than science. If you're what we call a lumper or a splitter. If you're a lumper, you're going to say, well, A, B, and C are all the same species anyway, because I just lump everything together. And if you're a splitter, you're going to say A, B, and C are all three different species because I split everything. But at that point then, do we have different scientists disagreeing? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So I can't go to a textbook and say, these are the species without maybe going to another textbook and seeing a different list You of could species. encounter that. Yes, and, and many times when they're arguing about these types of splits in different organisms, 
you may have 10 scientists arguing and have 17 different opinions. So even today, we, yeah, we don't agree, is that what yes, you're saying? Yes, There's no yeah. universal agreement. There's not for everybody, right. There are many of these examples still today where there's uncertainty where you draw the line of where the species is. So it becomes a little difficult to understand speciation and how speciation drives evolution forward when you really can't even identify, is it a new species, is it the same species, where is the species line drawn? Yeah, if we can't agree on what the word is, then how can we move on from there? Exactly. Really? And then we have recognition, and this was, in the, this was in the publication Science a few years ago, rapid evolution. So they're acknowledging, you know, changes can occur very quickly. I would argue as a creationist, one of the reasons changes occur very quickly is because the organisms are already pre-programmed for those changes. There's already a programming given by the creator that allows them to adapt and change quickly. So while it may be called rapid evolution, I would argue the better terminology is rapid adaptation. And here we're not talking about, you know, birds turning into cows. We're just Correct. talking about birds Correct. We're changing talking the about kind of bird it might be. A change be. of color, a change of maybe beak shape, a change of maybe skull shape. And that can happen rapidly. And that can happen rapidly, yes. Let's look at this for example. We have three different shapes of skulls. Now if all we knew about these skulls was what we would find in the fossil record, so we just dug these three up, what would be the paleontological interpretation? How would they interpret that? Would they say these are three different species? Would they say that this represents an evolutionary lineage? I would say almost for certain that's what they would do. This is a evolutionary lineage. But it's not. It's the purebred bull terrier skull as it changed between 1931 and 1976. So this is the skull of the same creature Correct. that man has developed with Correct. his breeding. Correct. And it's changed that much. It's changed that much. And so if all you knew about this was what was in the fossil record, you would draw a completely wrong interpretation of the data. Doesn't that give us pause of how we should interpret the fossil data if we recognize living creatures today can undergo this kind of change in very short periods of time, we don't necessarily then have appropriate interpretation in the fossil record saying, well, this must have taken millions of years. And this doesn't even represent an evolutionary lineage. This creature is not evolving into this creature, evolving into this creature. That's not how it's working. It's not what's going on here. You know, it right away reminds me of all of those diagrams and, and pictures that we've seen of the, you know, ape to human skull, which some of them aren't even as different from one to the next, and they're saying they're all these different hominids and well, so forth. But, right, particularly when you're trying to go with the pre-human skulls and trying to say these form a lineage up to modern mm -hmm. human, it can very much fit these types of categories where you're really just looking at variations of primates. They're not, they're not moving evolutionary upward to becoming a human. It's a variation of different types of primates. And here it's not even a very, it's the same exact exactly. creature over exactly. 40 years. Just selective artificial breeding wow. has caused this much change and we genetically understand why. Because in the DNA, we understand the certain repeated sequences, and I give an example, certain repeated sequences where you just, during, during the replication that occurs of the DNA, it now introduces a additional sequence of this. And then if it replicates again, it introduces another of this sequence. And when you introduce enough of them, you get dramatic morphological changes, such as the skulls we just showed. Another example would be repeated codons. You can have, for example, 18 to 20 codons for the amino acid glutamine. Or you could have it followed by 12 to 17 codons for the amino acid alanine. In other words, DNA sequences that repeat often create morphological changes. And so we can introduce a wide variety of morphological changes to animals, dogs and cats and cows and such, just simply by these repeated sequences. Now, there's still a dog, there's still a cat, there's still a cow, right? But we can introduce a lot of variety physically within these different organisms by these repeated sequences in the DNA. So we can get very dramatic changes physically just simply by these events. It doesn't explain how the cow became a cow. It doesn't explain how the dog became a dog. It just explains all the variety we see today. Within that 
within particular that, creature within type. Within that particular creature, correct. Mm -hmm. So the appearance of a new trait does not necessarily mean the appearance of new genes. We don't have to have a new genetic system in the organism in order to be able to get some of these traits. If I start out with dogs that have medium fur length and I breed them together, okay, what I could have then is I could have a combination of long fur and short fur. Nothing's changed genetically. It's just simply a matter of what trait is being expressed because of how I'm doing the breeding. So if we look at the standard evolutionary view of speciation. Okay, now I know that fellow there. That's, that's Mr. Potato Head. Mr. Potato Head. Exactly. What the evolutionists would interpret is that you have a Mr. Potato Head that doesn't have a face. And they would say then the speciation would be, we're going to form four new species. One new species now has purple ears. One new species now doesn't have any ears, but he's got a face. Another species, but no mouth. Another species doesn't have any ears, but he's now got a face and a mouth. And another new species has eyes, but not a mouth, nose, or ears. And all of that is brand new because none of it Correct. is from the ancestor. Correct. This would be the classic way that evolutionists would view speciation, is each species new introducing traits. some new, not only new trait, but some new genetic system that didn't exist mm. before. Now, if we look at what's really going on with speciation, we'd say we start out with everything there. And what we're going to do to make a new species is we're going to get rid of stuff. We're going to remove the face. Now we have just ears. We're going to remove the mouth. Now we've got a face with no ears or mouth. So we're going to get rid of things. This is a new species, but see it's going the opposite direction. I was going to say, it's upside down. They're, they're starting off with less and getting more. Correct. But what we actually Correct. see, and this what is what we, we see, actually see you have more, this. and exactly. then you get to less. Yes. Speciation is actually a reducing situation. You're getting rid of genetic events, genetic activity that was previously there. Now, they'd point to, well, but he's got white ears. Well, but that's probably loss of pigment, loss of something already there. And they say, well, he's got blue eyes. This guy has black eyes. Again, that's probably the loss of pigment giving him blue eyes. So yeah, you can see some physical differences occur from this original guy, but they're again a result of we've lost We're talking to Dr. Kevin Anderson, who's been sharing about evolution's flawed thinking. We've been seeing that evolution's thinking really is flawed. It has a number, of, a number of underlying flaws that affect the conclusions they draw to make them wrong conclusions. Yes. And especially as we try to get from one creature to the next in, in developing mm -hmm. these different species. Mm -hmm. so, so what do we have at this point? Yeah, as I was illustrating with the Mr. Potato Head example, Evolutionists view speciation as a gaining process, that you're developing all this new genetic activity, so, so look at you know, all of a sudden all this that you didn't have before. And what we actually see in speciation is the opposite. You, you remove, you take away. Uh, it may be a new trait, but it's because of lack of something, the genetics for a pigment or the genetics for some type of, of physical feature are now gone. You know, I think that's huge. <clears throat> The theory says this is what we should see. Science, an actual fact that we can see, does not show right. that at all. The appearance of a new trait does not in any way mean that it suddenly has new genetics, it suddenly has new genes. Now, the biblical view of speciation would in many ways be just the opposite. Families that we identify today class of classification-wise are going to be approximately the biblical kind, not, not necessarily, because again, classification by humans is very inaccurate science, but approximately we're gonna say that what we identify today as families would be probably close to what were the original kinds. And then as they lost genetic capabilities, as traits were pulled out, you then had 
speciation events occur leading to contemporary species. So it's really going the opposite direction. Yes, creation geneticists do accept speciation. We just accept that it's a whole different product from an entirely different event than what evolution would look toward. Let's look at the cats. We would have an original created kind of cat. We don't know exactly what it would have looked like. We probably would struggle to recognize it clearly, but it would have basic characteristics of, of fur and legs and tail and such. But from that original created cat, we now have the tiger, the lion, the saber-toothed tiger, the cougar, the domestic cat. And we have some genetic understanding of this because, for example, you can interbreed a tiger and a lion. It's called a liger for example. So we know that genetically there is a relatedness and this would be indication then of them coming from the same original cat kind. But again, see, tigers are tigers because so they lack the traits that lions have. It's a pulling out mechanism. Lions are lions because they lack the traits that saber-toothed tigers have. So it's not that the lion evolved something brand new, it's that they lost some of what was in the original created cat. So this original cat creature would have had more genetic yes, material absolutely. than any one particular absolutely. species of and cat this, today. And the same with the dog. Uh, the original kind dog was probably something a little bit like a wolf. But from that, you now have dogs and coyotes and jackals and foxes and wolves, all from the same original dog kind, the same thing. You get a dog by taking out the traits that give you a wolf. You get a coyote by taking out the traits that give you a fox. You don't suddenly put new genetic material in, it's the opposite. And so speciation is a removal process, not an adding process. The very opposite of what evolution's showing. We, we have to have opposite. this ancestor that has all the material and then as you pair, you pair off different mates and so mm -hmm. forth, mm -hmm. they, they don't have what their other one had and it just See, you would have started with less. a created gene pool. And from that gene pool, then you have all this variety that'd be capable of producing what we see today. Mm. So see, the evolutionary link would say that there is a link between the felines, the cats, the canines, the dogs, and the muscatella, which would be, for example, skunks and otters. See, so they'd want to put a connection here between all three of those families. So there should be a creature there, somewhere in the earth, right? That, some, that creature, part this cat, creature, part dog. yeah, this creature should have existed at some point in time. But see, this is purely speculation. Mm -hmm. It's pure speculation. In fact, in response to an article I wrote, Perry Marshall wrote a, he wrote a book called Evolution 2.0 where he tries to recover some of evolution by putting God in it more, which I don't understand quite why, because God doesn't need evolution, and evolution claims to not need God, but Perry Marshall says evolution does need God, okay, which I find a little interesting. But in response to an article I wrote, Perry Marshall wrote a letter to the editor in the Creation Research Society Quarterly, and in that letter he admitted that I freely acknowledge universal common descent is still far from proven. So my response to that is, well, if it's still far from proven, why am I supposed to be so compelled to accept it? So this, this universal common descent, this isn't finding one cat kind, this is finding like one amoeba it, that well, everything yeah, came from. It, well, it's, it's finding all the links of all animals, including the link that's supposed to link the feline, the canine, and the muscatella together. But see, we don't have that. And when we look then at what we actually see, remove the speculation, See, there's no connection. This is not connected. So you it have different exist, trees right. that never yes. join together. And that is the creation model. And in fact, there's been two studies that just came that came out in 2018 that give us genetic basis of exactly that. That these groups are separate genetically. And we don't see all the connections that universal common descent should be giving us, which is not what you would expect to see if universal common descent is linking all these organisms together. So genetically, uh, what, what the study has shown is what we see more in the Bible, the different exactly. kinds and the different exactly. separated gene strands, or, uh, and yet the evolutionists are saying we shouldn't see that. The study is showing that life has unique, distinct boundaries, which is exactly what the biblical model is, and the opposite of what the evolution model would be. So um, biblical creationists like yourself would say, yes, we have an original cat kind creature, an original dog kind creature, an original you know, uh, uh, skunk type of creature, um, but we don't have 
something that links everything right. together, that keeps going back. There's no fossil linkage and there's no genetic linkage. Life exists in very distinct pockets, very distinct groupings, and there's not, there's not this historical linkage of all these. So that's, that's very strong to biblical created kinds and strongly contradictory to all life shares a common ancestry. Well, I want to thank you for being on the show, sure, Dr. Anderson. Pleasure. This is fascinating, but unfortunately, we're going to have to stop there. Evolutionary theory is saying that new traits, new genetic material can come from ancestor to progeny. But what we're seeing is exactly the opposite, that you have to start with all of the material in the ancestor and then it gets specialized off, either increasing or decreasing in certain traits, but nothing new is added. That's what the science is showing us. You know, it just goes to show you that we know what the Bible says is true and the proof is all around you. I wanna thank you for joining us for this edition of Origins and we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program, number 1907, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.